for participating in today's hearing. D.C. crime is out of control. Anyone who lives, visits, or works in D.C. has seen the impact that weak, weak on crime policies have had on public safety. In recent years, the D.C. City Council has taken a variety of steps that have weakened the city's crime laws, requiring Congress to step in. In 2020, the D.C. City Council cut $15 million from the Metropolitan Police Department budget. Simultaneously, the Council repeatedly passed temporary emergency policies that restricted police officers' authority and changed the D.C. criminal code. For the first time in 30 years, Congress had to act and nullify a D.C. law because it was so ridiculous. Crime in D.C. is so bad that President Biden was shamed into reversing his veto threat. Months later, the House and Senate had to act again. We passed another resolution to overturn the anti-police policies implemented by the D.C. City Council. Unfortunately, President Biden vetoed this bill. This was a missed opportunity, as today, D.C. crime continues to remain a problem. In my hometown of Wisconsin, I hear from countless families who are concerned with crime and policies we have in place. Last spring, Wisconsin adopted a new amendment to our state constitution related to bail reform. This amendment came as concerns for public safety and crime continue to increase. The same can be said for Capitol Hill today. I hear from visitors and staff alike who share their concerns about crime in our nation's capital. Capitol Hill, specifically Ward 6, which encompasses the Capitol complex, has seen an increase in violent crime in the past few years. I'd like to note for committee record that we invited Ward 6 Councilman Charles Allen to our discussion today. The committee made several attempts, but unfortunately, Mr. Allen did not answer our request to participate in today's hearing. As chairman of the Committee on House Administration, I'm committed to ensuring our nation's capital and surrounding areas safe for every American family. I think we can all agree, whether you're here for a tour of the Capitol or to meet with your representative, every visitor deserves to feel safe. Each year, the Capitol Visitor Center alone welcomes an estimated 2.5 million visitors to our nation's capital. However, in the last year, we've seen a dramatic increase in crime in Washington, D.C., particularly near the Capitol complex. Let's examine the numbers. In 2023, violent crime was up 39% year over year in our nation's capital. There are over 6,800 motor vehicle thefts in D.C. There were 959 carjackings. For context, there were 152 carjackings in 2019. In Ward 6 specifically, which includes the United States Capitol, there were, over, there were over 150 robberies in the past six months, and 350 vehicles were stolen. Last year, two of my colleagues were victims of crime. In September, I hosted a security briefing where we heard from two staff members who were mugged at gunpoint just down the street. These individuals shared their stories about the dangers of violent crime and the need to remain vigilant. Each of these statistics represents a staff member, a visitor, a member of Congress. As the Committee on House Administration, we're tasked with the oversight over the Capitol campus security. Rising crime in our nation's capital, particularly near the Capitol, has constrained resources for U.S. Capitol Police and the Sergeant at Arms. U.S. Capitol Police must devote more and more of their resources to increase threats against the Hill community. These resources may otherwise be spent on the U.S. Capitol Police's actual obligation and their core mission. As crime continues to remain a serious threat and concerns for members, staff, and visitors, I'm focusing on finding ways we can reduce violent crime in our nation's capital, in particular near the Capitol campus. Today I'm looking forward to hearing from our witnesses about how violent crime threatens U.S. Capitol security. We'll explore the impact of soft on crime policies, and we must discuss how we can ensure the Capitol is safe and secure for all visitors and staff. As chairman, I'm committed to making Capitol Hill a safe place to visit and to work. With that, I'll now yield 
the ranking member five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Chairman, for uh, convening us. Um, let me uh, begin, first of all, by offering congratulations. I know we have some new staff here, a new parliamentarian, assistant parliamentarian, deputy clerk, so I want to congratulate uh, these appointees and wish them uh, the best as they take on these new responsibilities. And I certainly want to welcome our panel. First of all, uh, always good to see uh, Chief Manger. Thank you for uh, your long service, Chairman Pemberton uh, and Mr. Uh, Manguel. We're, we're grateful for your uh, service and for being here today. I, I don't think there's a responsibility I take more seriously as the ranking member of this committee than the safety of staff, visitors, and certainly members on and around the Capitol campus. And I've said this before, I'll say it in the future, the law enforcement has our back. It's critical that we have your back as well. That includes the United States Capitol Police, uh, the Washington Metropolitan uh, Police Department, as well as federal law enforcement uh, agencies like the FBI and, uh, and ATF. It's no secret that in 2020, during the pandemic, homicide and violent cre crime increased across the nation. Thankfully, while there is so much more that needs to be done, um, in 2023, violent crime and homicide rates dropped significantly. Last year saw one of the lowest rates of violent crime in the United States in more than half a century. Those are my, uh, uh, you know, observations. Those are the statistics. Unfortunately, the District of Columbia has been the exception to the rule, and the congressional community has not been immune to this uptick in violence here. Members, as the chair has um, indicated, have been assaulted in elevators and carjacked, and staff have been brutally stabbed and robbed at gunpoint. So I'm pleased that the District of Columbia has taken some steps to address these issues. As I understand earlier this month, the D.C. Council passed the Secure D.C. Omnibus Amendment Act, which contains about 100 provisions, increasing gun violence penalties, expanding the definition of carjacking, addressing organized retail theft, and more. I must point out, however, that this is at least the fourth hearing convened by um, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle on crime in the nation's capital of this Congress. Despite all the talk of armed robberies and shootings, I've yet to hear my colleagues meaningfully address the issue of common sense gun safety measures to keep guns out of the hands of criminals in the District of Columbia. On the contrary, the fiscal year 2024 financial services and general government funding bill includes a policy rider advanced by uh, my Republican colleagues that would permit concealed carry of firearms in the District of Columbia. It's astonishing that you would do that at a time when we're concerned about violent crime. Guns, and let's make this clear, guns make violent crime more violent and more deadly. And I struggle to rec reconcile my colleagues' concerns about violent crime with a complete disregard of the key driver of those crimes. There are no commercial gun stores in the District of Columbia, so the guns used here are from out of state. These guns are often acquired illegally through either straw purchasers or unlicensed sellers. Yet every single Republican on this committee who was here in last Congress voted against the bipartisan Safer Communities Act, which created the first federal criminal statutes for firearms trafficking and straw purchasing. Just recently, Capitol Police officers arrested a man uh, just off Capitol grounds carrying a rifle he brought to the District of Columbia from um, the state of Georgia. Unless we take common sense steps supported by a majority of Americans, people on, um, of the American people on the question of illegal firearms will never fully address or solve the violent crime issue here in Washington. That's why I've introduced the State Firearms Dealer Licensing Enforcement Act and will soon reintroduce the Gun Theft Prevention Act. These bills would crack down on gun trafficking by ensuring oversight and licensing requirements for firearm dealers and by granting ATF the tools to hold repeat offenders accountable. We also need to support the efforts of federal law enforcement partners like the FBI and ATF who in the last few months have redoubled their efforts to track down and prosecute violent criminals in Washington, D.C. What we should not be doing at this time is to call for the defunding of the FBI and ATF. Finally, I'd be remiss if I didn't note the role the federal government plays in the local criminal justice system here in the District of Columbia. For example, when the Metropolitan Police reports to the city government, much of the rest of the criminal justice infrastructure is federal, which creates serious coordination issues. In a tragic example of these issues, according to the chairman of the D.C. Council, the individual who stabbed Senator Rand Paul Staffer was released by the Federal Bureau of Prisons with no notice to the District of Columbia. 
He was supposed to go into custody or supervision of another federal agency, the Court Services and Offender Supervision Agency, which apparently did not happen. So the coordination is an issue we must address. Um, I want to thank again our witnesses. I'm looking forward to your testimony and to the questions, and I uh, look forward uh, to the proceedings. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Member yields back. Today we have a one witness panel. We welcome Chief Manger, uh, Mr. Gregory Pemberton, uh, and Mr. Raphael Manguel. We appreciate being with us today and look forward to your testimony. Pursuant to paragraph B of Rule uh, 6, the witnesses will please stand and raise their right hand. You solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Let the record show that the witnesses all answered in the affirmative. I'll now introduce our panel of witnesses. Our first witness is Chief Thomas Manger, who is the chief of the U.S. Capitol Police. Chief Manger was appointed as chief of police in July of 2021. Chief Manger has served 45 years in the policing profession, including more than two decades as chief of police for three of the largest police agencies in the national capital region. Our next witness, Mr. Gregory Pemberton, is the chairman of the D.C. Police Union. Mr. Pemberton joined the Metropolitan Police Department in 2005 and worked in patrol and vice in the 3rd District. In 2020, Greg successfully ran for the position of chairman of the D.C. Police Union and was re-elected in 2022 and again in 2024. He currently serves and represents the 3,000 members of MPD's rank and file. Our last witness, Mr. Raphael Manguel, is, uh, is a fellow at the Manhattan Institute. He's authored and co-authored a number of Manhattan Institute reports and op-eds on issues ranging from urban crime and jail violence to broader matters of criminal and civil justice reform. We appreciate all of you being here today and look forward to your testimony. I'll now recognize Chief Manger for five minutes. Chairman Stile, uh, Ranking Member Morelli and members of the committee, thank you for the invitation to testify regarding crime and safety in and around Capitol Hill. The department greatly appreciates the committee's continued support of the men and women of the United States Capitol Police. Congress's support has been invaluable as we continued our work in addressing law enforcement demands within our jurisdiction and the dramatic workload increases in an ever-expanding volatile threat environment throughout the country. I want to start off with a very brief video. Um, this is, is something that happened just two weeks ago. Um, a lookout was broadcast. Uh, for a robbery that occurred at the CVS on I Street Southeast. And um, you, what you're going to see is a, it catches a suspect as, um, as he runs, um, uh, flees the scene. And um, I'm going to show you what happens next. So you'll see here in a moment there's a, a black SUV that comes down the street and stops. Uh, there it is right there. And it's going to stop on the corner. These, uh, uh, and you see two women jump out of the SUV and, because they have seen the suspect fleeing down the street. And the one intercepts him, the other one tackles him. Wow. Then you see the driver of the SUV, a, a male, help uh, bring the suspect down, the, and the fourth suspect, or the fourth individual, uh, came out of the uh, back passenger seat. Uh, all four of those individuals were um, Capitol Police officers. Uh, the first one who intercepted him, uh, the tall woman, was uh, Deputy Chief Janita Mitchell. Um, and the Inspector uh, Carnesha Mendoza tackled him. Um, Dave Millard and uh, Sergeant Angela Singletary assisted with uh, getting him into custody. This is just an example of the almost daily interaction that the USCP has with our law enforcement partners in the National Capital Region. It's a mutually beneficial relationship that allows our department to fulfill its mission in securing the Capitol and the surrounding neighborhoods in order to keep members, their families, staff, and visitors safe. By necessity, we're more and more a protection agency. However, at its core, the USCP still has traditional police department responsibilities. The department has patrol officers who enforce traffic laws. We have criminal investigators, crime scene technicians, officers that handle prisoner processing, motorcycle units, top, a top flight bomb squad team, canine units. The department deals with the enforcement of the law as it applies on capital grounds and the extended jurisdiction zone in order to protect the campus and the members and staff who work, reside, and travel through the neighboring communities. Like the, for instance, like the case last year where USCP officers spotted a stolen car, 
tied to multiple carjackings in, D in the city. The suspects in the vehicle were considered armed and dangerous. The vehicle sped away from our officers, we chased them, and when they bailed out on foot, our cops ran them down and took them into custody, recovering a gun and a high capacity magazine. Right after that, uh, that case, one of our bicycle officers spotted a suspect wanted by the Secret Service. Our officer took multiple knives and a chainsaw blade off of the guy. The Secret Service also found that the individual had fake police equipment in his car and charged him with impersonating a police officer. I'm sure that some of you may recall when the USCP officer uh, confiscated an M4 style uh, rifle near the Senate parks. They stopped, uh, they also, uh, th that day they stopped the assault rifle from getting on to Capitol Hill. Even more recently, we made an arrest of an individual carrying a machete on Capitol grounds and arrested another individual for carrying Molotov cocktails just off Capitol grounds. Just last week, officers at the Capitol Visitor Center prevented a man with a hammer in his backpack from entering the Capitol. Over the course of the last two years, we've had a member attacked in their apartment building, a member and staff carjacked, and a staff member assaulted at the congressional baseball game. The fact is, our community, the members of Congress, their staff, their families, our visitors, don't just stay on Capitol grounds. Many live here when, when they're in session. For many, this city is the home, their home away from home. The USCP works hand in hand with the Metropolitan Police Department of Washington, D.C. and our other law enforcement partners to keep people safe, and we patrol and respond to where our community lives, works, and plays when they're in the nation's capital. You each should have a map of our extended jurisdiction zone. We have full police authority in that zone. You should also know that the USCP has a roster of locations where many members reside when they're in session and we regularly patrol and respond to those buildings and areas 24-7. Our partnership with MPD is as strong as ever. They never fail to assist us when, when needed, but our cops are out there as well. In conclusion, earlier this week, for example, we responded to an assault in the 400 block of New Jersey Avenue. We arrested the individual who struck a passerby with a, with a tree branch. And then just a couple days ago, we responded at 3 o'clock in the morning to a man who was throwing bricks at the front of a house of a home on Maryland Avenue. We responded, we stopped the guy, and we took him into custody. The home that was damaged was adjacent to the home of a U.S. Senator. The U.S. Capitol Police understand that our priority has to be this Capitol campus, but we also understand that our community doesn't just stay on this campus. And so we are working hand in hand with the Metropolitan Police Department in the areas in and around Capitol Hill when we have events um, outside in the city, but outside the, the, Capitol, uh, or the uh, Capitol Hill area. Um, we send our folks there to ensure and, and enhance the safety uh, in partnership with MPD. We will continue to do that, and I'm happy to answer any questions that the committee may have. Thank you, Chief Manger. And if I can, I think on behalf of all the members here, uh, we want to extend our appreciation to all the men and women uh, that serve in the U.S. Capitol Police. Uh, I think the four individuals you highlighted in that video who are involved in taking down a suspect uh, is a, it's a reminder of how dangerous of a job all of our law enforcement officers have. And so we thank those four, uh, but it's the countless men and women that work at U.S. Capitol Police. And so if you could extend our appreciation. Thank uh, you. Appreciate it. Our, our next uh, witness is Mr. Greg Pemberton, and you are recognized for five minutes. Good morning, members of the committee. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. As the chairman of the D.C. Police Union, I speak on behalf of approximately 3,000 sworn police officers, detectives, and sergeants who serve the District of Columbia as members of the Metropolitan Police Department. I'm a detective grade one, and I've worked for the MPD for 19 years. I take great pride in serving the city. My testimony here today will be an effort to inform the committee on issues related to crime in the District of Columbia. I will try to answer three questions that I hear most often here in the district. Why is crime so bad? How did it get like this? And what can we do to fix it? My testimony will focus on how numerous actions by the DC Council to include their rhetoric has resulted in a mass exodus of sworn law enforcement officers and an exponential increase in violent crime. Beginning in June of 2020, the DC Council began introducing anti-police legislation designed in their own words to quote, act accordingly to bend the arc of justice, end quote. I'd like to provide a list of just some of the legislation that the D.C. Council would introduce over the course of the next two years. The Comprehensive Policing and Justice Reform Amendment Act, 
the Strengthening Oversight and Accountability of Police Amendment Act, the Revised Criminal Code Amendment Act, Reducing Law Enforcement Presence in Schools Act, Law Enforcement Qualified Immunity Cessation Act, Law Enforcement Presence Sense Impression Act, Law Enforcement Vehicular Pursuit Reform Act, the School Police Incident Oversight and Accountability Amendment Act, and the White Supremacy and Policing Prevention Act. The rhetoric that council members used when speaking publicly about law enforcement amounts to nothing short of virulent attacks on all police officers in the district. One council member stated in a public hearing, quote, I know for a fact there are police in the district who are bad actors and who have been going on without the proper penance, end quote. He felt the need for Metropolitan Police officers to receive, quote, some kind of retribution. Other council members bragged about defunding the department or making, quote, the biggest reduction to MPD he had ever seen. In a hearing that took place just two weeks ago, many council members became apoplectic when there were proposals to roll back just some of the legislation that I mentioned earlier. Without delving into the granular details of how terrible these bills are or how blatantly awful the council's rhetoric is, I can assure the members of this committee that the direct result has been a mass exodus of police officers from the department. Since the beginning of 2020, the MPD has lost 1,426 officers, more than one-third of the department. 540 of those separations, nearly 40 percent, were resignations, employees who just walked away from a career with the MPD. The MPD currently has over 500 vacancies for the position of sworn officer, and our chief of police has testified that it will take over a decade to fill them. These dangerously low police officer staffing levels take away valuable resources from our ability to respond to and investigate crime. Losing patrol officers and detectives impedes the department's ability to close cases and to engage and speak with victims in a timely manner. Crime stats in the district closing out 2023 are absolutely staggering. Homicides have reached 274, a 35% increase. Carjackings reached 958, a 105% increase. Robberies were up 67%, and violent crime overall went up 39%, and all crimes went up 26%. These statistics I have mentioned are citywide. If one parses out the data to the neighborhood level, some of these communities have grown to look like war zones. The district's Ward 6, which encompasses the Capitol, Downtown, Navy Yard, Eastern Market, Barracks Row, and Capitol Hill, experienced a 188% increase in homicides, a 66% increase in robberies, a 42% increase in sex assaults, a 57% increase in carjackings, and a 44% increase in violent crime. Over the past three and a half years, our union has been sounding the alarm about this problem to anyone within earshot, including the D.C. Council. We try to inform our elected leaders of the unintended consequences of these policies. Unfortunately, we've been ignored. D.C. residents and businesses, and, excuse me, and business owners are under siege. Members of Congress are being assaulted and carjacked. Your congressional staff members are being robbed and stabbed. Tourists and visitors, your constituents, are being targeted and attacked. Yet the D.C. Council fails to admit that their policies have played a significant role in this outcome. Now, almost four years later, we have all seen the results of D.C. Council's experiment. The empirical data is in, and we know for a fact that their efforts have been an abject failure, resulting in thousands of more victims of crime for the city. The lasting impacts of these horrible policies will not be fully realized for some time, and the efforts to repair the damage done could take decades without swift and thoughtful actions. If we do not undo the failing policies put in place by D.C. Council that are pushing our police officers to leave MPD, crime will continue to rise and thousands more victims will be subjected to crime and violence. The purpose of my testimony here today is to inform the committee on this ongoing crisis that exists in the district and to publicly state that we are prepared to assist in any way we can. Again, I thank you for the opportunity to testify and I welcome any questions the committee may have. Thank you, Mr. Pemberton. Uh, Mr. Manguel, you're now recognized for five minutes. There we go. Chairman Style, Ranking Member Morelli, and other members of this distinguished body, I'd like to begin by thanking you for the opportunity to offer remarks on an important topic. To put it bluntly, our nation's capital is very much in the midst of a crime and disorder crisis. In 2023, a year in which the latest FBI estimates suggest the nation saw homicides decline by 13 percent and violent crime decline by nearly 6 percent, Washington, D.C. saw homicides spike 35 percent and violent crime increase 39 percent. For historical context, D.C.'s 2023 homicide total was the highest it's been in 26 years. Robberies and car thefts in the district were up a whopping 67 and 82 percent, respectively, in 2023, while carjackings nearly doubled, even after half a decade of year-over-year -year increases. And those numbers are even more concerning than they might seem at first glance, because robberies, carjackings, and assaults are occurring at such high numbers, despite the fact 
that D.C. has, like other cities, seen a market shift in what criminologists call routine activities. In short, foot traffic, in-office work, and public transit ridership in D.C. are all down significantly which has reduced the number of opportunities for offenses to take place because there are fewer targets in public spaces. In other words, what the official crime statistics don't fully capture is the increase in the rate at which opportunities for crime are actually converted into victimizations. According to an analysis of cell phone data by the University of Toronto, foot traffic in downtown Washington as of last spring was just 70% of what it was pre-pandemic. Data published by the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority shows that on weekdays, rail ridership in November of 2023 was just 55% of what it was in November of 2019. And just last week, the Washington Post reported that office attendance is at, quote, 48% of pre-pandemic levels as a preponderance of federal workers still work from home, and, quote, more than 20% of downtown storefronts and offices are vacant. All of this means that the crime increases seen in the district reflect an even larger increase in the risk of victimization. And this phenomenon was recently illustrated by research published last fall in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, which found that activity-adjusted crime rates, i.e. crime rates that accounted for the amount of time that potential victims actually spent outside, showed that in New York, Los Angeles, and Chicago, people in public spaces were, quote, 15 to 30 percent more likely to be robbed or assaulted in 2020, even though the number of robbery and assault offenses recorded in those cities that year decreased. The increase in victimization risk is on its own sufficient cause for urgency when it comes to combating crime here in Washington, but it's worth noting that the economic and broader societal impacts of rising crime and disorder are unlikely to be positive. Research establishes that violent crime can impact housing prices, economic mobility, and even standardized test performance. Then there's the potential effect of crime and perceptions of public safety on tourism, which should be particularly concerning for Washington. And all of this raises two questions. What might explain the recent crime spike and what can be done about it? The answer to the first suggests the answer to the second. Like so many other American cities that have seen crime spike in recent years, D.C. has fallen short in two important ways. First is the dwindling number of experienced police officers on the street. Last spring, the now former D.C. Metro Police Chief Robert J. Conti reported to the D.C. Council that the department was down some 450 officers compared to 2020, bringing it to its lowest staffing level in half a century. This is not unrelated to the sharp decline in arrests throughout the city, a measure that has remained low after falling off a cliff midway through 2020. Strong causal analyses show that the addition of new officers will likely reduce homicides, particularly in the city's most troubled enclaves, and D.C. knows firsthand just how effective police surges can be on crime as it was home to one of the well most well-known studies on the effect of additional police presences on crime. Second is the fact that serious violent crime in Washington is driven disproportionately by chronic offenders with extensive criminal histories, suggesting that not enough is being done to incapacitate those who repeatedly offend. A 2021 report published by the National Institute for Criminal Justice Reform reported that, quote, approximately 86% of homicide victims and suspects were known to the criminal justice system prior to the incident, and that, quote, most victims and suspects with prior criminal offenses had been arrested about 11 times for about 13 different offenses by the time of the homicide. And that measure was in line with what Chief Conti related to reporters in March of last year uh, when he said that homicide offenders in D.C. had 11 prior arrests, which is in line with measures from other cities. The repeat offender problem certainly hasn't helped by, uh, by the decline in the share of felony and misdemeanor arrests charged uh, by the U.S. Attorney's Office. Total cases charged by that office hit a 20-year low in 2022, though recent reporting for the Washington Post shows, shows that more cases were filed by U.S. Attorney Graves in 2023. Still, there is much ground to make up on that front. The reality is that D.C. has not been immune from the general national trend toward depolicing and decarceration. I don't think it's a coincidence that the city has also seen public safety deteriorate since more dramatically moving in that direction. Now is the time to pause and recalibrate. The recent passage of the new omnibus crime bill by the D.C. Council last week is a good first step, but the city is far from out of the woods, even if recent year-to-date crime numbers show declines on, on some crime measures. If the city is to achieve a true turnaround on the public safety front, it is going to have to address the gaps in policing and prosecution that have allowed too many chronic offenders to walk the streets of our nation's capital with too few officers to respond and prevent the sorts of offenses that have been plaguing D.C. residents and visitors for far too long. Thank you very much, and I look forward to answering any of your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Manguel. Um, we'll now begin our questions, uh, follow, starting with me, followed by the ranking member. We'll then alternate between the parties. I'll now recognize myself for five minutes. Um, start with you, Mr. Pemberton. Countless congressional staffers have been robbed within a mile of the Capitol. 
Last year, uh, a staffer for Senator Rand Paul, uh, he was stabbed repeatedly, puncturing his lungs and skull. A member of Congress was assaulted uh, in an elevator, and a, and a representative was carjacked just down the road. All these crimes happened within a mile of here, largely in Ward 6, represented by Council Member Charles Allen. We invited Allen to speak today, but he rejected that invitation. Mr. Pemberton, you mentioned some of the bills that D.C. Council passed in the last two years that have had a negative impact on policing. I want to focus in on the Youth Rehabilitation Act that passed in 2018 uh, that reduced sentences for first-time offenders. Is it true that the bill raised the age of what is considered a youth to 24 years of age? Uh, that's correct. So if a 24-year-old was to commit a carjacking with a gun at our nation's capital, they would be eligible for a reduced sentence under that law? That's correct. If you encountered people who've used this program more than once, contrary to how the program was sold? A absolutely. So you know individuals who are over the, well over the age of 18, up to the age of 24, who could commit a carjacking with a gun, be eligible for a reduced sentence, and that can happen multiple times? Yes, absolutely. And what would be the impact of an individual uh, who does this? Is that, what, what, what's your analysis of that law? Uh, there's no consequence for the actions of their behavior, and they, they understand that. So when they get back out on the street, uh, they're free to recommit these crimes as often as they like. What does that do to the morale of police officers serving in the Metropolitan Police Department? Uh, it's, it's horrible because you're arresting people for violent crimes, and then they're back out on the street the next day, and then they're, they're never held accountable for their actions. And um, it, it really had, takes an impact on morale. So an officer would risk their life to try to apprehend a dangerous criminal, in, in this case maybe a 24-year-old who carjacked someone with a gun, only to find out that this individual is treated as a youth in our nation's capital with limited consequences and can find themselves back out on the street in short order to commit another crime? This, this is what happens more often than not. Yeah, this is regular. So then if we look at the numbers in D.C., violent crime increased last year by 39 percent, homicides increased 35 percent, robberies increased 67 percent, and carjackings increased 82 percent. And so for the reasons, for those reasons, we created a House Security Resources Guide uh, after a briefing with you last September. Would you agree that the D.C.'s increase in crime is a direct result of the policies pushed by the D.C. City Council and anti-policing and soft on crime policies? Absolutely. And to go to you, Mr. Manguel, is it safe to say that the nationwide research shows a correlation between increased crime and anti-policing soft on crime policies? Absolutely. Let me come back to you, Mr. Pemberton, if I can. In 2023, D.C. had the fifth highest homicide rate of any city in the country. That's saying something. And it's not saying anything good. Meanwhile, the average homicide suspect in our nation's capital had already been ar arrested 11 times. Is that accurate? That is correct, yes. And so we're looking at these trends where officers are arresting time and again as having a detrimental impact on morale, correct? Absolutely. And so, Mr. Pemberton, in your testimony, you mentioned the Comprehensive Policing and Justice Reform Act uh, was negatively impacting police. There was a number of policies that are in there. Can I ask you what the impact of negative rhetoric by the D.C. City Council towards police uh, has had on officers? Uh, yes, so the discussions that came out around all these pieces of legislation and then the regular conversations that the council has about policing generally are incredibly negative. And, and the, the message is loud and clear from the council and the rank and file members are receiving that. The council does not like police officers. They do not want them doing police work. They don't want them making arrests and they certainly don't want them getting out and stopping and investigating people. Uh, that message is loud and it drives people away from the department and people who, uh, th those that don't leave the department are apprehensive about doing their job. Thank you. And then is, is noted because of the dramatic increase in crime in particular in the area surrounding the Capitol, this has an overflow effect on you, uh, Chief Manger, uh, in your officers. Is it accurate that last year Capitol Police made 234 arrests related to DUI, assaults, drugs, motor vehicle thefts, uh, and weapon law violations? That's correct. And so have you seen a dramatic uptick in those types of arrests uh, in the Capitol Hill area over the last four years? Yes, we have. 
And is it made your job harder and the job of the U.S. Capitol Police harder to deliver on your chief mission, which is securing and protecting the Capitol complex? Uh, it, it, yes, but we, we look at uh, our crime-fighting responsibilities as integral to uh, our mission. So it's just, it just like so many other areas of our mission, it has just increased. The volume Thanks. of work has increased. Uh, understood. You, we appreciate the work that you and the, the men and women under your command do every day. I think D.C. Uh, in 2023 is a stark example of what happens when anti-police, soft-on-crime policies are implemented. The data is clear. When you make a police officer's job harder and more difficult, when you denigrate the service of police officers, when you defund police, there's negative consequences. In contrast, we are going to continue to support the law enforcement officers and in particular, the law enforcement officers at Capitol Police who are, who are doing their job to protect visitors, staff members, and members here, and will ensure that they have the resources to do their job, I'm committed to making sure the U.S. Capitol and the surrounding area are safe. I'll yield back, and I now recognize the ranking member for five minutes. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, I appreciate all the comments made by the witnesses, and obviously this is a, uh, a uh, challenging, challenging issue. I do note that since there's been extensive use made of statistics, I just thought I'd uh, read some of the more current ones And um, uh, for the year 2024, which admittedly we're only about a quarter of the year in, so I want to be uh, uh, mindful of that. But uh, as I understand, according to the Metropolitan Police Department statistics, a homicide in 2024 for the same period in 2023 is down 31 percent. Assault with a dangerous weapon is down 32 percent. Robbery down 8 percent. Violent crime overall down 16 percent. As it relates to property crimes, burglary is down 19 percent. Motor vehicle theft down 30 percent. Theft from autos down 23 percent. Arson is down 40 percent. Property crime uh, down 11 percent. I just make uh, an all crime down 12 percent. I assume if these trends continued, some of the remarks that have been made would be withdrawn by people who have made them um, since we're relying so heavily on statistics. And I certainly hope that the trend lines continue. But I also uh, just want to note uh, for the record that while um, a number of statements have been made about continuing to support law enforcement, I do uh, note that the uh, Republican House bill on uh, uh, CJS, which is uh, uh, commerce, justice, and science, um, that the Republican bill, had it passed, unfortunately it did not, uh, would have cut funding for the FBI by $415.3 million, uh, as opposed to fiscal year 2023, would have reduced ATF's funding by $149.9 million, and would have reduced uh, funding for United States attorneys who prosecute these federal crimes by $320 million. So. For, for folks who continue to talk about supporting law enforcement, some of my colleagues either have amnesia or uh, don't rec recognize the importance of supporting law enforcement at the federal, state, and local levels. Um, I want to uh, ask you, uh, Chief Manger, particularly since you have responsibility for the Capitol Complex and this, this hearing is really about Capitol Hill, in fact, it's titled Safety on Capitol Hill, um, and you have responsibility that. You mentioned in your testimony that the Capitol Police uh, confiscated an M4-style ghost gun near the Senate parks, stopped an assault rifle from getting to Capitol Hill, and arrested an individual with a high-capacity magazine. I also know you have experience as a police chief in both Maryland and uh, Virginia. How are these guns making their way into Washington, D.C.? Um, typically, they're, they're coming from uh, other states. And I, I can tell you, having been a, a police officer in Virginia for um, 27 years, um, Virginia's got plenty of guns. And many of those guns are making their way into Washington, D.C.? They make their way to a lot of places. And would your, in your opinion, your professional opinion, would the Capitol campus and the area immediately around it be safer without M4-style ghost guns, assault rifles, and high-capacity magazines on the street? Certainly in the wrong hands, yes. Yeah. Do you believe your officers would be safer if it was more difficult to obtain? M4-style guns, assault rifles, and high-capacity magazines? So as, as um, any, any police officer safe when there's fewer guns around, um, in, in my view. Um, 
I want to ask you, um, you you've, you've talked about and others have mentioned the attacks that uh, have um, occurred on members of Congress as well as staff. Um, and what are the safety resources available to members and staff when they're off Capitol grounds in D.C.? You mentioned a little bit in your testimony. I wonder if you could just expand on that. So we um, do, uh, as, as when we have congressional events that are off campus, um, we certainly uh, want to provide escorts or um, uh, resources. And, and one of the initiatives that we're um, looking to do is to uh, uh, reach a, a memorandum of, of agreement with MPD so that when we have a congressional event, I'll give you an example like the congressional football game or the congressional softball game, um, that we have authority to take action should something happen. Um, in, we, we have that in the extended jurisdiction zone. If we can have that at any congressional event, no matter where it might be in the city, that would be of great benefit to us because, again, um, we're not trying to replace MPD. MPD is the best partner we have, um, at, but um, we can supplement and, and focus more resources when uh, our community is, is uh, in and around the city. Very good. Um, I, I want to join with you, M Mr. Chairman, and certainly thanking the officers of the Capitol Police Department, MPD, who uh, put their lives on the line every day. We're entire, uh, completely grateful for your service and for your sacrifice, and we'll continue to support your efforts. And with that, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Dr. Murphy is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a point of inquiry. Can we subpoena the D.C. City Council? Do you know if we're able to subpoena the D.C. City Council? Uh, we, we do have that authority. We invited uh, Mr. Charles Allen. Mr. Charles Allen rejected the invitation to attend. We did not. I don't know why this uh, crime and the safety of individuals within this community is a partisan issue. I don't get it. I don't get it. Bullets can kill Democrats just as well as they can kill Republicans and innocent individuals. Um, there is a reason that criminals should be prosecuted. I'll remind um, our, uh, our colleagues that uh, money for prosecutors doesn't matter if the laws don't allow them to be prosecuted, period. So, you know, I'm just going to remind everybody here, the Michael Brown incident in St. Louis was a tragic one. But the bullet, show, the bullet holes were in the top of his head showing that he did not have his hands up. He was charging the police officer, period. That's when so much of this started, and truth matters um, when we're dealing with these things. This is infuriating. It's, it, it's absolutely infuriating. We're allowing a city council to let havoc be wreaked in this town because they don't like law enforcement. It's time for the adults to come back in the room and make this country and this city safe. Uh, questions to, um, excuse me, to uh, our uh, Mr. Pemberton. Um, can you tell me what, when we're dealing with police chases, what the policies are in this city? Um, the Metropolitan Police Officers Department has very strict policies on vehicle pursuits. Uh, we're the only vehicles we're allowed to pursue uh, would be when a violent felony is committed, and um, if we believe there's an imminent threat. Uh, of serious bodily injury or death if we don't pursue okay, that. Well, tell me about carjacking. What happens with those? Uh, in certain circumstances, officers would be able to pursue those vehicles. Uh, in reality, uh, most of those pursuits are called off by management officials. Because of what reason? Uh, the danger, that the perceived danger that there could be uh, or possible bad uh, public relations uh, for a vehicle pursuit. You know, I, I had a condo here in town. Uh, there were five shootings in three months. My wife would take our dog out just in the median to um, relieve itself, and I felt no longer safe for my wife. And I'll be damned if I'm going to risk my life coming here, up here to serve the people of North Carolina and serve the country and get shot doing it, just yes. because the city council here is absolutely derelict in their duty to protect the citizens in which they are charged. Uh, just a, a following up uh, with that, as far as jurisdictional grounds, um, what happens if the uh, police uh, chase an individual outside D.C. into Maryland or any of the surrounding communities? What happens with that chase? Uh, in certain circumstances, metropolitan police officers would be permitted to, uh, to pursue a vehicle into other jurisdictions, uh, but most often in reality those pursuits are called off. When, when you have discussions with the city council, what's the tenor of those? Are you immediately, because of the role in which you, which you are, are placed, are they immediately adversarial? Uh, 
yes. Uh, m many of the meetings that we've made with city council members uh, that we thought would be productive, they would send low-ranking staff members and not show up themselves. And then we would try to have conversations with those individuals, which I would imagine were not even related. You know, it's interesting. D.C. wants statehood, and this is the type of uh, legislative body that they, uh, that they demonstrate themselves to be. How in hell could people want that, anything other than reasons than being political, that they want two more votes in the Senate? They, do, they have not shown the ability to protect their citizens. And, you know, our, our Capitol Police do a fantastic job, um, but if our, our D.C. police are handled, well, what am I supposed to think if, God forbid, my wife gets carjacked and the criminal who does that is literally slapped on the wrist to go out and do it again? We're in our nation's capital, for God's sake. I just don't get it. What is the purpose of allowing criminals back on the street to, re to repeat their offenses? Um, uh, can you give some examples? I'd love to hear this. You know, uh, the carjacking thing absolutely destroys me. We had a member of our own body carjacked by three individuals at gunpoint. Person got slapped on the wrist. What, am I, what are we supposed to do this? How, what kind of pursuit policies actually will allow our officers to actually do something about it? And God forbid we do it, we turn them into the attorney, to the uh, prosecuting attorneys, and they just push them right back on the street. What does that do to the morale? Uh, officers do not want to work in an environment where their work is meaningless. P people join the policing profession because they want to help their community. Uh, this isn't a job where you get rich. This is a municipal government position, and people typically take this job because they like what they're doing. And they put their lives on the line for the safety of the citizens that they protect, yet they're not, it's just a circular firing, firing squad. You know, I'm not allowed to carry a gun unless I go through a hoops and hoops and hoops, but then I'm only in a specific area, and I'll be damned if I'll let a criminal hurt my wife. God forbid he tries to do something to me. I feel sorry for him, to be truth be told, um, that this should happen. This is absolutely against what the laws of the United States should dictate, and here we are allowing our own individuals to wreak crime across this nation, and damn it, it's a damn partisan issue, and I just don't get it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back. Gentleman yields back. Mr. Laudermilk is recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you for having this hearing. Very timely and very important. Thank you all for being here. Thank you uh, for your service. Um, you know, it's, it's essential that we have the resources here to protect the members of Congress, the staff, even the visitors that, that come to Capitol Hill here. And the crime that's in the city has an impact on that. Um, and let me say this. I have the greatest admiration for uh, those that wear the uniform of law enforcement, both in the city, Capitol Police. I'm uh, here today because of the bravery and heroism of one of the Capitol Police officers on the baseball field in 2017, who uh, on his own drew fire to allow me to try to get to one of the players who had been already shot. Um, and uh, David Bailey will remain a hero, uh, not only to me, but to my family. And I appreciate uh, their dedication. Um, Chief, good to see you again. It's been almost 16 hours. Um, I, I appreciate, um, I, I mean, you were at the Gershwin Award last night. I think it's important, uh, not only you be there, you were in uniform. And s to show one thing is that even though the jurisdiction may be Capitol Hill, it really follows anywhere that we go as members, whether it's somewhere else on Capitol Hill or whether it's um, it, we're traveling in a, a, a Codel or we're traveling somewhere else. And so it's not just what happens on Capitol Hill, but it's the crime in the area because I was even thinking of this last night as we spoke about this hearing. Here we are, not on Capitol Hill, but we're in D.C. with a significant number of members of Congress that are there. Um, I know that uh, the police budget request for fiscal year 24 was $841 million, and that has increased substantially over the past five years. Chief, uh, can you speak to the challenges that the, the department is facing that led to that increase, the request? So it, it really comes down to um, 
our, our mission and our workload. Uh, our mission has expanded and our workload has gone up dramatically. And, and I've, you've heard me talk uh, many times about uh, the number of threats against members of Congress. Uh, and you, you've heard me talk about um, the uh, uh, number of demonstrations that we handle and, and the tactics that these demonstrators, you know, seem to, e that seem to escalate and uh, which requires a, a, a commensurate response from, from Capitol Police. Um, so, uh, and with one of the things that, that I have done since, since I got here was to um, take a more, um, uh, a broader approach to the safety of our community. When I say our community, I'm talking about the members of Congress, our staff, the visitors, um, and not, so when they, when they cross the street and they're no longer, you know, in the Capitol complex, okay, well, that's somebody else's problem. No, we, we, um, we take responsibility for our community um, as, as best we can. Um, a good example is uh, um, Union Station. There's a lot of activity uh, over at Union Station. Some of it is great and some of it is criminal. And so we, uh, we assist Amtrak police, we assist uh, Metro Trans police, and we assist MPD to the best of our ability. We monitor the radio. So when we hear 911 uh, dispatches come out over MPD's radio, if we're close by, our cops respond because um, we, we, we want to be able to help. Again, MPD is the best partner we have, and they always come to help us when, when we, we have the need. So we want to be uh, better par good partners as well and uh, you know, make sure that folks that are in and around Capitol Hill, when our community is at an event, we're, you're going to see us there. All right, and, and, and I know it's beyond just Capitol Hill because in our recent policy conference, Several members of the Capitol Police were there securing us. We have conventions coming up that I'm sure that you're going to be involved in both hundreds, of those. Hundreds of officers. And yes. so, yeah, there's a, there's a big draw on force. Mr. Pemberton, does, does MPD face similar challenges that necessitate more funding? And is it true that uh, you're at the lowest uh, level of officers in, that you've been in in 50 years? Uh, that's correct, the lowest staffing levels we've had in 50 years. Um, and, and funding would be a problem if we didn't have uh, a shortage of 500 police officers. So not paying those 500 cops that are supposed to be here I think is saving the city a lot of money. Uh, but e even when the city has thrown money at this, right now they're offering $25,000 signing okay. bonuses to become a Metropolitan Police Officer, and that's not moving the needle. And the reason is, is because of this climate and this environment that's been created by the City Council, it is not an attractive place to work for current employees or potential future employees. All right. Well, thank you. I see my time's expired. I also want to thank you for uh, your response on January 6th. Um, uh, you guys were an integral part of that, so thank you. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Ms. Bice is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I first want to say um, a heartfelt thank you to uh, Capitol Police and Metro Police for the jobs that you do. I come from a state that we respect law enforcement and we abide by the letter of the law. And every week that I get on a plane and I fly to DC, my husband wonders if something is going to happen to me while I am here, working, serving the people of Oklahoma's 5th Congressional District. Uh, it is absolutely infuriating to me what is happening to the nation's capital right now. People call my office. Uh, excited to come this summer to tour the monuments, to uh, bring their children. And one of the questions they're asking my office is, can you tell me about safety? Why in the world do we have to have a conversation with visitors to the U.S. Capitol, the heart of this country? We have to worry about safety. It's just appalling. And, and I think it should be noted, the, you know, majority of the members, you know, have been popping in and out, but we haven't seen the majority of the Democrat side attend this hearing, nor did they offer up a dem witness to be able to ask questions to. As my colleague, uh, Mr. Dr. Murphy mentioned, this isn't a partisan issue. This is a safety issue. And it was brought up at the beginning of this uh, hearing by the ranking member. Uh, there was a discussion about gun violence. This isn't a gun violence discussion. This is a prosecute the crimes uh, that the individuals are committing in this city problem. And it was referenced that we are arresting uh, young people under the age of 24 and not prosecuting them. The D.C. City Council and the mayor of D.C. should be held fully accountable for the crime that's happening in this city. 
it's infuriating to me. Chief, um, I want to start with you. How is the USCP trying to you know, suppress or deter crime in the Capitol Hill area? So we're, we have the advantage of having um, a much smaller jurisdiction than other police departments. But um, as, I've, as I've said, we certainly um, understand that, that we can be of service and we can be of help to the neighborhoods uh, in and around Capitol Hill. We, we respond to calls that we hear come out in this area. Um, and I think it's important that um, we work in partnership with MPD to help help them. And uh, but we we and and we I talk all the time about us being a, a protection agency, which we are. But we cannot ever walk away from our police responsibilities. We st we're still cops, and we still fight crime. And on this campus, if you if you took the crime rate of, of things that happen on this campus. It's, it's very low. There, there's not a lot of crime on this campus. Not, not, not non-existent, but there's not a lot. Um, so to the extent that we can branch, push that out to the surrounding neighborhoods, certainly push it out where we have congressional events, um, we, we're going to continue to do that. So it's just bit, um, uh, understanding that we need to continue to take our police responsibilities very seriously. It was mentioned uh, by a couple of my colleagues that uh, we have a 50-year low for um, the number of officers on the MPD currently. Is your um, USCP trying to help augment some of the um, 500 um, police officer shortage that the MPD is seeing currently? To the extent we can, absolutely, especially in, in the area where, where, where we're patrolling. And so we, you know, we would offer them the help the same way they offer us help every day of the week. So yeah, we're, we, we're doing our best to work hand in hand with them, yes. Um, if I can also just ask, what do you think that uh, proactive measures that can be taken by either members or staff um, to try to you know, uh, protect the safety of people in and around the Capitol? What should we be doing? So um, we, we offer uh, a fair number of services um, in terms of escorts, in terms of, of um, uh, what we call law enforcement coordinations. And I still, it, it still frustrates me that um, the participation rate, the request rate for those services is very low. So just encouraging your colleagues, encouraging staff members, encouraging, uh, you know, at any event that you all might have to um, let us know so that we can help co either coordinate with the state and locals who are uh, in the jurisdiction or we can be there ourselves. The last thing I think um, I want to um, read, which I think really gets to the heart of the problem, it has to do with some of the police reforms that have come forward. Um, and I would say that D.C. isn't prosecuting the crimes, not just these individuals that are being classified as youth that are under 24, but a, but a myriad of other crimes as well. There were over, over 15,000 uh, crimes committed, um, according to the, the report that I have in front of me, but uh, more than 10,000 were not uh, actually prosecuted, and I think that's part of the problem. Maybe the D.C. City Council should look at um, changing their statutes to allow for an elected uh, DA to be able to hold a DA accountable, and with that, Mr. Style, or Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentlewoman yields back. Uh, the gentleman from the state of Ohio, Mr. Kerry, is now recognized. For I want to minutes. thank the chairman and also the ranking member uh, for, for having this hearing today. I do want to point out a couple of things. I, I happen to be uh, one of those members that actually lives in a, in a neighborhood very similar to Capitol Hill in Columbus, Ohio. And, uh, you know, so we have, we have seen the uptick, of course, and I've talked to our police officers there. Um, and the recruiting efforts that they are facing is um, equal to what I think is consistent with what I'm seeing across the country. I also do want to point out that, uh, uh, you know, we, when you reach a certain age, a lot of your staff uh, tend to be about the same age as your children. And uh, we had three of our young staffers that were just walking back on Capitol Hill, uh, one of them is here with us today, um, that were attacked by a homeless guy with a knife. And, you know, as a father, you, you hear that and you view these young staffers as professionals, but you, you, you're mindful. Um, so anyway, along those lines, um, I do have a few questions. Chief, I'd like to kind of start with you. Uh, as we know, the Capitol Police expanded jurisdiction reaches beyond cap the Capitol campus itself into some of those surrounding neighborhoods. And you mentioned this in your, in your written testimony, you also highlighted it. 
Um, and you describe some of the multiple incidences that you've responded to in the crimes in the near, nearby area. What are the greatest challenges that you face with the jurisdiction of these neighborhoods? Um, the, the, the biggest challenge for us is that once you get beyond that extended jurisdiction zone, and, you know, and oftentimes we're patrolling beyond there because we've got a building where 30 members of Congress live, so we, we're patrolling that three, four, five times a night. Um, the fact that we, if, if something happens, oftentimes we'd have to call for MPD to take some sort of action because we don't have the uh, authority that we need. Well, um, with, with that, what would you say the coordination with MPD, what's, what's that typically like? It's, it's great. Um, uh, but but a, a very quick example, we had at the uh, um, congressional softball game last year, it was beyond our extended jurisdiction zone. We had a group of demonstrators walk on into center field and, and stop the game. Um, we called for MPD because we did not have the authority to arrest them because it was outside the extended jurisdiction zone. What I would like is to have a, a memorandum of agreement. We have several memorandums of agreement with, with MPD um, to be able to, at a congressional event, that we would, in fact, have the authority to, to take police action at, at something like that. So we wouldn't have to wait for them um, to, uh, to arrest, make the arrests. And, and I appreciate that. I'm a, I, something else, and, and like I mentioned, you know, I, I live in a neighborhood very similar to Capitol Hill. It's uh, in the city of Columbus. Um, and, of course, many members do um, across the country. And so, Chief, can you describe how the Capitol Police work with our local law enforcement agencies nationwide to ensure member security in our own districts? I appreciate that question. We, we have um, dozens, and, and uh, that number is growing exponentially, um, dozens of, of uh, uh, memorandums of agreement that have been signed with state and local police departments from around the country so that we can request their assistance and they will provide that assistance for uh, a, an event in, in, uh, in a member's home district so that they will provide additional security and we will uh, we'll reimburse them for any cost of, of that, that assistance. So we work very well with state and local agencies from around the country and as, as you uh, may know, we have uh, nationwide jurisdiction to investigate threats against members of Congress. But the fact is we don't have the staffing to invest, you know, to, to go all over the country to do something. So we, we work with state and locals and we have great relationships all over the country. Um, lastly, and I only have a minute left, uh, how many arrests does the Capitol Police make in a typical week from uh, DUIs or other criminal suspects coming from D.C. into the nearby campuses? Um, you know, traffic offenses, including DUIs, um, we probably make a dozen or so every week. Um, and, uh, but I will tell you that the number of arrests um, over the last couple of years has gone up each year. Yeah. And as somebody who was a staffer here in the 1990s, I can tell you it, uh, it's definitely changed in many ways for the better, but uh, obviously we're seeing this uptick. Um, really appreciate your testimony. I appreciate the work that you do with our local security teams. Um, I know we have a person on our, on our staff that coordinates with you guys, and you guys have done a fantastic job, and I appreciate that. With, with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields back, a former law enforcement officer. Mr. DeEsposito is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you all for being here today. And, and this is rare, um, but I have to disagree with my colleagues uh, when they say that this isn't partisan. This is actually, in fact, partisan, because Democrats and their legislation has created this issue, whether it's here in Washington, D.C., in our nation's capital, or if it's home uh, in New York. They have passed and promoted pro-criminal, anti-law enforcement legislation that has led us to this situation. Law enforcement officers actually wear handcuffs on their gun belts to use them against criminals. But Democrats in places like New York and Washington, D.C., have allowed those handcuffs to be put on us to not do our jobs. And I know that in the beginning of the, uh, of the hearing, we heard that uh, the beginning of this year, it seems that crime is down in Washington, D.C. And uh, Chief Manger, Mr. Pemberton, you guys have been in law enforcement for how many years? 45. 45? 19. 19. That's 64. We'll add mine in. Let's say 
almost 80 years, all right? 80 years on the job, what season uh, do we usually see the least amount of crime committed, especially those on the street? Probably be the winter, right? When the weather gets nicer, crime tends to spike. Okay. So now, I know that we also talked about guns. One of the issues that we're facing with guns throughout this country is that people are getting arrested with illegal firearms and they're not, they're not, they're not getting prosecuted. We see guns being taken off the streets, but very often the criminals who tote those firearms are able to walk the streets freely again before the cops are actually done with their paperwork. Now, Mr. Pemberton, I know that uh, you were in the violent crime unit, similar to the, the work that I did. If you had to take a, a guess, an estimation, how many firearms, how many guns have you, a gun arrest, have you been a part of in your career? Uh, I would have to say at least over a thousand. Okay. I, my number's probably a little less. You have some more time on the job. My next question is this. Out of the over 1,000 gun arrests that uh, you were part of, how many of those individuals, when you went to arrest them, presented you with a license to carry that gun? Zero. So gun licensing really would have nothing to do with the carrying of firearms because those who are breaking the law really don't care about what gun laws are, correct? That's correct. Okay. Now, in all of the guns that you have recovered, I guess we should focus more recently here in Washington, D.C., because it seems like the other side of the aisle wants to talk about assault weapons. They want to talk about high-capacity uh, firearms when, in fact, m much of the time, the people who speak the most, and I'm not talking about Mr. Morelli at all. I have great respect for him. But there are people who love to speak about um, high-capacity weapons. They love to talk about uh, guns that are in mass shootings. Um, but in fact, they really don't know much about firearms and they don't even know about the guns that they're speaking of. So in the arrests that, that have been made by the MPD, um, how many of the guns over the last year would have been handguns? You could give an estimate. I'm sure you don't have the number off the top of your head. Yeah, I don't. I know that last year we recovered about uh, like 3,200 firearms. I don't know how many were handguns, but I would, get, I would venture a guess that it was at least 90%. So 90% of the guns recovered last year in Washington, D.C. You said 3,200 were recovered, so 90% of them were handguns, illegal firearms, and not one of those people probably presented a license to carry it. I think that's fair, yes. Okay. And a lot of those individuals were repeat offenders, right? They've been arrested, they've been part of the criminal justice system. Why? Because over the last few years, legislation implemented by Democrats throughout this country has made this country less safe. It's a fact. And Mr. Manguel, I know that you mentioned in your opening statement about the dwindling number of police officers. Why do you think we have a dwindling number of police officers? I think a lot of it has to do with the rhetoric um, and the environment that's been created by policy, and I have some personal experience with this. Exactly right. It's the rhetoric and it's the policy that's been created. It's the rhetoric that is being spewed by Democrats here on Capitol Hill, by anti-cop people throughout this country, and it's the policies, not only policy, because now we're talking about laws, actually things that are on the books. People took pens, put them to paper, and passed legislation to make this country less safe, to make the jobs of law enforcement harder, and to give criminals free reign to do whatever it is they want without any repercussions. It's why, right here on Capitol Hill, you can't go to CVS and get batteries because they're locked up. Why? Because people go into stores, take whatever they want, and walk right out. That is the country. That is the city that Democrats have created. And I blame it, and I say it's partisan, because they're the ones who have carried this banner. They're the ones who have passed this legislation. And they're the ones who have doubled down and said, we're going to continue to do this. My time has expired, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Ms. Lee is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you to our witnesses who have joined us here today for your important testimony and also your efforts uh, to fight crime, to fight violent crime, and your work to ensure that those who live and visit our nation's capital can do so in a way that is safe. I would also like to discuss today a program uh, with the Capitol Police, uh, Chief Manger, 
the Special Assistant United States Attorney Program and how that is a program that you are utilizing uh, to actually help ensure that you are keeping uh, members of Congress, other government officials, and the public uh, safe. Would you please describe for us the Special Assistant United States Attorney or SALSA program that you are using in field offices in Tampa, Sacramento, and D.C.? So these um, uh, DOJ has provided us with the authorization to have these um, SALSAs to prosecute cases nationwide and to assist in prosecuting threats against uh, involving members of Congress. The Department of Justice has also designated our um, uh, SALSAs as subject matter experts on threats cases. Um, we, we've had great success with them. The, our SALSA in Tampa has worked multiple cases in the middle district of Florida leading to guilty pleas and threat cases involving a threat against a member of Congress, other federal officials, and in one case a threat against a Supreme Court justice. Um, we, uh, uh, he, we've had, again, great success. The SALSA in D.C., their primary portfolio includes managing the threat portal for U.S. Attorney's Office in the District of Columbia. A uh, number of cases uh, involving members of Congress as victims, congressional staff members as victims, uh, or crimes that occurred on Capitol grounds, we have our own prosecutor that makes sure those cases go forward. Do you foresee or would you hope to see an expansion of the SALSA program into additional cities across America? I think as the workload uh, um, is, it, it presents itself, that it's a, it's a, a very efficient way um, for us to handle a lot of these cases so that not every investigator, not every attorney is flying out from D.C. We've got folks around the country that um, can be on the scene uh, working these cases. And could you describe, I believe the CELSAs also provide a training to case agents and investigators within the threat assessment section. Could you describe for us that section and how the CELSAs are working to help train case agents and investigators? They, they are the subject matter experts on uh, threat cases. And we, we get, and as everybody here knows, you get um, threats and concerning calls and, and directions of interest um, that are very concerning. And these uh, attorneys uh, train our officers to know when it, it uh, crosses that line from being just free speech or being just something concerning to something that is a, a criminal threat. And in your assessment, has the program as implemented thus far uh, been successful in addressing some of the rise in threats against members in Congress? Absolutely. They, they, we, we have uh, better success in terms of prosecution now than we did before we had this program. And can you tell us why you think that changed, why that better rate of success is happening? I think it's because um, this is their primary job. You know, pr prior to this, um, we, would, we were competing with attorneys that had a huge caseload and, and, you know, sometimes they just looked at our case and said, okay, you know, not sure this is going to rise to the level of, of being a priority for, you know, for me because of, I'm pr prosecuting much more serious cases. Um, this way we have folks that their priority is working uh, threats against members of Congress. Thank you, Chief. And Mr. Manguel, last fall, the Committee on House Administration held a briefing for members and staff regarding the rise in crime in Washington, D.C. Uh, it included safety tips and advice for how best to protect oneself against uh, carjackings and the proliferation of other things like assaults and robberies that we've been seeing here in the district. Would you like to provide any additional insight or advice on how residents or visitors to our nation's capital can protect themselves from these types of violent crimes? So unfortunately, I can't say that I have any expertise in terms of uh, giving advice on personal security, but the one piece of advice that I would give residents is to urge their policymakers and their representatives in the D.C. Council and in Congress to push harder on anti-crime measures. As I mentioned in my testimony, one of the, it's, it's very, very clear that the criminal justice system's capability of dealing with repeat offenders has been eroded, and it's been eroded for quite some time, and that's why you see the most heinous crimes consistently committed by people who have 10, 15, 20, 30 prior arrests. It, to, to my mind, one of the most effective uses of time that citizens can make with respect to this issue is, is putting pressure on their elected officials to make some changes and stop that problem where it is. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentlewoman yields back. Uh, we're in the home stretch here of our hearing, but I'd like to recognize the ranking member for brief closing remarks. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and, and again, thank you all for being here. This is a complicated and nuanced issue, no doubt, and uh, more resources 
would clearly be helpful. I, I want to, Ms. Lee, point out an interesting point as it relates to the U.S. attorneys, which is, again, why I'm so strongly opposed to the proposed $320 million cut that was proposed by House Republicans uh, for U.S. attorneys who do great work all across this country, including prosecuting cl crimes here in Washington, D.C. I, I did, and I'm sorry that Mr. D'Esposito left, but since he raised a couple of things. First, as it related to uh, 2024 crime statistics, he talked about seasonality. I was actually comparing the same period of time of year from January 1 to uh, March 21st. So basic statistics, you want to compare like things, and that's what I did. So um, I understand there will be seasonal adjustments. But he raised another thing, which he said this was a partisan issue and basically condemned Democrats uh, and, and, and uh, blamed us for uh, the crime issue. I wasn't going to raise this, but I am going to now, which is um, violent crime, as I said in D.C., is, a, is, is obviously of concern to all of us. Uh, but I note, according to a study by Third Way that looked at 21 years of crime data, at the peak of the violent crime spike in 2020, murder rates were 40 percent higher in red states, defined as states that voted for former President Trump in 2020, as opposed to blue states, defined as those states that voted for Joe Biden in 2020. The murder rate in states that voted for Donald Trump exceeded the murder rate in the states that voted for Joe Biden every year for two decades from, 20 th from 2000 to 2020. Over the course of those 21 years, the per capita murder rate in Trump states was 23 percent higher than the murder rate in Biden states. Even if you remove murders in the largest cities in red states from the equation, those dominated by Democrats, murder rates in Trump voting states were 12 percent higher uh, across the 21-year period than Biden states, which included those Democratic-controlled areas. I ask unanimous consent to enter this study entitled The Two-Decade Red State Murder Problem into the record. And I would say again, Without objection. this is nuanced. Um, and look, I have strongly, as a Democrat, supported more resources for law enforcement. I will continue to do that. Uh, and I believe we should have zero tolerance for crime in general. So I don't disagree with many of the comments made about prosecution. But it is impossible to look at the crime problem in the United States without looking at uh, gun safety measures that are common sense. Um, we have 400 million guns in the United States today. That's more than a single gun for every man, woman, and child in the United States. I have a family of hunters um, and people who take this very seriously. And most uh, people do take uh, gun violence seriously and gun safety. But we have a problem, and not to acknowledge it and to suggest that the only reason that we have problems because Democrats in urban areas, I think, is uh, just irresponsible and I think is beneath the, uh, the, the really learned approach that needs to be taken by the, by the Congress in addressing these problems. But again, uh, thank you for the hearing. Mr. Chair, thank you again to the witnesses for your service, and uh, I yield back. The gentleman yields back, uh, and I, th I thank you uh, for your attendance. I'll note, if we're debating if this is a partisan issue, I think it's telling one Democrat showed up willing to defend the soft on crime policies of the D.C. City Council. The rest of the entire Democrats on this committee ducked out. Why? Because it's pretty darn tough to defend a 24-year-old male who uses a gun to carjack someone being treated as a youth. And that's the policy here in our nation's capital because of soft on crime policies. It's pretty tough to defend the fact that the average homicide suspect in our nation's capital has been arrested 11 times before. It's pretty hard to defend the massive rise on crime we've seen in Washington, D.C. over the last four years after in 2020, the D.C. City Council and the mayor cut the budget for the law enforcement officers in our nation's capital. So it's not surprising to me that only one Democrat on this committee showed up. It's partisan because we see Democrats and the radical left have driven through soft on crime policies. And what we've seen here is the empirical data of what happens when you do that. And you combine that with the anti-police rhetoric from those on the left that we documented here today, shared by Mr. Pemberton, what the impact is on the morale of law enforcement officers and how hard it is to recruit men and women to join the law enforcement community, to put a badge over their heart, to walk out the door every day, not knowing what the call will be, but knowing that they're going to answer the call on all of our behalf. And everyone, visitors, staff members, members of Congress, have a right to feel safe 
in our nation's capital. And right now, far too many don't feel safe. And they don't feel safe because of the policies put forward by liberals in the D.C. City Council that have allowed crime to spike in our nation's capital. And as chairman on the Committee on House Administration, I can tell you I'm committed to making sure that you, Chief Major, have the resources that you need to be able to do your job and to be able to make sure that we continue to put pressure and pass laws as we have to overturn soft on crime policies in our nation's capital. We've been successful once. We've been vetoed by the President of the United States another time. But we're going to continue our efforts to make sure that everyone, visitors, staff members, members alike, are safe here in our nation's capital. And I'll be, I want to, on behalf of, I think, of all the members who showed up, I want to say thank you to the law enforcement officers of the Metropolitan Police Department, the men and women of the U.S. Capitol Police who are out there every day, whose jobs are darn hard, in particular darn hard because of the policies and the soft on crime policies that have been advocated by this city council. So I'll pause there and I'll just once again thank our witnesses for appearing before us today. Your comments were very helpful. Uh, the members of the committee may have some additional questions for you and we ask that you please respond to those questions in writing. Without objection, each member will have five legislative days to assert additional materials on the record or to revise and extend their remarks. Now pursuant to paragraph C of Rule 14 of the Rules of the Committee, uh, I will hereby appoint March Bell as Parliamentarian of the Committee on the House Administration and Thomas Lane as Assistant Parliamentarian on the Committee of House Administration. In addition, pursuant to rule, paragraph B of Rule 14, I hereby uh, appoint Anne-Marie Cake as Deputy Clerk of the Committee on House Administration. Without objection, letters announcing both appointments will be placed in the record and a copy of these letters will be available to all committee members. There being no further business, I want to thank the members for their participation. And without objection, the committee stands adjourned.